Well, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer so we can get rolling and people can keep moseying on in, okay? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for all the gifts that you pour out upon us. You give us the greatest gift there is because you give us yourself. Please open our hearts and minds to all you have to share with us. Holy Spirit, please give me facility of words so that everything I say will glorify you and set a fire of love aflame in the hearts of my brothers and sisters and me as well. In your precious and holy name, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, as crazy as it is, this is my very first Defending the Faith conference where I've actually spoken. I'm always at Applied Biblical Studies, and I didn't do that one this year. And so it's a joy to be here with you guys. I was actually at this conference years and years ago, right after I became Catholic, and have not made it back since. So this is fantastic to be here with you, and it's a little surreal to be a speaker at this conference now, given the fact that I'm a pastor's kid who uh, was really anti-Catholic growing up. Uh, stories, but I won't share them with you this time. But what I want to talk to you guys about today in this session, again, my name is Matthew Leonard. Um, and for those of you who are kind of like, weren't, weren't you with the St. Paul Center? Scott mentioned it last night, just to clear air. I was the executive director and executive producer at the St. Paul Center for more than a decade. I just left to go out on my own in January and founded Next Level Catholic Academy, which is an online subscription site that's dedicated to spiritual theology and laying out a systematic unpacking of Catholic spiritual teaching. It's called the Science of Sainthood. It's the first course in there. We have people that are in the Science of Sainthood here right now? I have a few. That's great. Overnight, the thing became the largest online school of spiritual theology in the world. Just like that. It's been awesome. Um, and one of the reasons why I love Catholic spiritual theology and what I love what we're going to talk about here today is because our lives as Catholics are not meant to be spent treading water just waiting for Jesus to come back and praying to God we're not in a state of mortal sin or if you read a bad book and you're thinking that the rapture is going to happen because the rapture is not going to happen, people, just so you know. That's bad Catholic theology. If you have any of those Tim LaHaye books, their highest and best use is firewood, Okay. But our lives as Catholics are supposed to be transformative. We are on a process of divinization. That's part of what I want to talk to you about. You are supposed to be transformed in this life. And one of the main ways we do that is through our relationship with sacred scripture. So we're going to talk about scripture. I'm going to pivot to prayer. We're going to talk a little bit about Lexio Divina, silence, and then I'm going to tie it all together in the liturgy. But what is this? Is it a coffee table book? No, this is like my little condensed travel size Bible, right? This is the one that oftentimes has gone with me on the road. But the Bible, guys, this is our book. This is our book. Okay, the Bible is unlike any other book ever written. The Catechism says that God is the principal author of sacred scripture. And yes, he used human authors to write down things inside of it, but they wrote down exactly what it is that he wanted and nothing more. And that's why we call it the inspired, inerrant word of God. And we call it that because the Catholic Church does. And where did it come from? Because I used to think as a Protestant, it went, you know, drop down and out of the sky into the pew in front of me. I had no idea that it was Catholic synods and councils that gave us sacred scripture back in the fourth century. That was total news to me. And when you step back and think about it, just by saying that there is a Bible, you're giving tacit approval to the Catholic faith. Because no church, no Bible. The church came first. And she's like, woohoo! Catholic Church gave us this book that looks great on our bookshelves, you know? Oh, George, make sure you put it at eye level so when Father McGillicuddy comes over for dinner, he can see it in the built in bookshelf, right? And I realized this is the Defending the Faith crowd. I know you guys are the uber Catholics. But how many of our brothers and sisters in the faith, certainly not us, really only encounter their Bible when they're dusting? I mean, that's the only time they find it. And I think even times those of us who have really tried to make an effort to get through sacred scripture find ourselves at a loss at times. How many of you guys have ever tried to read the Bible all the way through? How many of you made it past the book of Leviticus before you passed out? And you guys are the troopers, the ones with your hands still up. It's hard because there are all kinds of levels of meaning that are going on in sacred scripture and levels of nuance, and that's because it's a divine book. You are never going to be able to plumb the depths of sacred scripture in this life. So what I want to do today is boil the Bible down to its essential purpose. I want to show you that it is a love story. 
And I want to show you how this love story between God and man is meant to be wedded to our prayer lives so that we can be incorporated into the family of God for which each one of us was actually made. So the Bible is basically about how you and I were made from nothing less than the sheer love of Almighty God and how he gave us life, how he set a plan in motion to save us even after Adam and Eve rejected this outpouring of love and got us kicked out of the family of God and how in the fullness of time, God sent his only son to save us and to reincorporate us back into the family of God for which we were made. The Bible is the biggest, mushiest, most beautiful love story ever written. And yes, I got enough sleep last night. You're like, some of the parts I read in there, yeah, I know. But top to bottom, this thing is the biggest love story in the world, which means women, you guys should be all over this thing, right? Because you're always dragging us off to see like Pride and Prejudice and Anna Green Gables and all that kind of stuff. I got three little girls. I've seen all of those things multiple times. And I'm not saying that men are not romantic. You guys heard me last night, right? That little love email I wrote to my wife. That email, the female book I told you about is that thick. Like literally, men can be romantic too. In fact, I used to drive all the way from Chicago to Steubenville after two weeks of work, 55, 60 hour work week. I'd fight through rush hour traffic in Chicago, drive eight hours on the most boring road in all of America, I-80, right? Just so I could stare for an hour and a half into the chocolatey dark eyes of my wife, right? Or girlfriend at the time. So I get the whole romance thing. And when I wasn't with her, I was calling her. I was writing those emails. So there is a romantic side to, to men as well. And just talking about her makes me want to miss my wife. But the Bible, the Bible's way better than my stuff. Even if my stuff was good enough to f into marrying me, the Bible is a love story of biblical proportions. It's the real goods. And we don't have time to go through the entire story of sacred scripture. So what I want to do right now is zoom in on one of the books of the Bible that actually kind of embodies this idea that scripture is a love story. And that is the Song of Solomon. Hey, the Song of Songs. I can hear it. Woo, right? What is the Song of Solomon? It's a poetic allegory about the desperate love between a bridegroom and his bride. They're longing for each other. Listen to the bridegroom. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats moving down the slopes of Gilead. <laughs> Can you imagine, ladies, if you went into the hairdresser? You're like, Flo, forget the tapering up the back. I want you to make my hair look like a flock of goats going down the slopes of Gilead. Can you do that? I'm not sure what it looks like exactly. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing all of which bear twins. Your lips are like a scarlet thread and your mouth is lovely. You are all fair, my love. There is no flaw in you. Come with me from Lebanon, my bride. You have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart with a glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How sweet is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Like, right? <laughs> Gentlemen, slap that on a Valentine's Day card and see where that gets you, right? Now, why am I reading this, this stuff? Because it's chilly in here? It's not really chilly in here. But what I want to try and just make you understand and help me understand, too, how much it is God longs for us, how much he thirsts for us, how much he desires union with us, real union. Right? And so the Bible, it, God is that bridegroom in this passage. Okay? We are the bride, metaphorically. And that's why the Bible is filled with all kinds of examples of, of the, the, highest, the highest examples of the, all the earthly love that we know. Like the love between a bride and a bridegroom is this thing that we can all identify with on some level, this longing for each other. In fact, earthly marriage is an icon, right? It's an image of the divine life of the Trinity, which is one of the reasons why the church teaches against contraception, guys. Anything that inhibits our marriages from being able to image the, the love communion between the Father and the Son is wrong. Contraception cuts off that mutual self-donation between spouses and we're no longer imaging the Trinity. It's one of the reasons why the church teaches against contraception. 
And if you go through the Bible, especially in the Song of Solomon, if you've ever read through it, there are a lot more romantic examples that you could point to of the kind that you kind of close the Bible when your pre-prebescent teenage son or pre-prebescent son's walking by. He's like, oh, don't let him read that part, right? There are some erotic examples in there. And, and the Bible is filled with this. Now, I don't want to confuse anybody with this kind of language, okay? Because the Song of Solomon is an allegory of God's love. It's a poem expressing to us in human terms, so terms with which all of us can identify God's love for us. And really, that love for us is a reality we can't even comprehend. Can you comprehend God? Because God is love, says 1 John 4, 8. Okay? And, and because God, what he does in the Bible is he uses examples of human relationship to try and convey this idea to us of how much that he longs for us. But even though we're talking about metaphors and allegories and poems, there's a reality here. Realize that. There is a reality. God really wants to wed himself to us. Sacred scripture starts with the story of a wedding in the Garden of Eden. It ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb, when we are fully brought into the divine family for which we were made. Now, not everybody's married, right? Priests aren't married for the most part. Nuns aren't married. Lots of Catholic single people. That's great. Romance is something that everybody can identify with, you know, on some level, which is one of the reasons why Hallmark movies are so popular. You've seen one, you've seen them all, right, ladies? But... <laughs> There's an even deeper, more universal expression of the love that God wants to convey to us, and that is the relationship between father and child. A hey, father and child. More than anything else, the image of God as our father is really the fundamental basis of our faith. In fact, Blessed Columba Marmion said that God's fatherhood is the fundamental dogma that precludes all others. In other words, everything we believe as Catholics starts with the idea, the idea of understanding that God is our father. And he's been fathering for all time, right? That's what the Bible is really all about. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, Jesus uses the term father 17 times. And he's not just telling us who he is. By using that terminology, he's telling us what our identity is. Okay, because through the sacraments, what happens? We become part of the mystical body of Christ. So God isn't like our Father. God is our Father. That's our reality. Who's your daddy? God is your daddy, right? And God has been Father from all eternity. It's who he is in his identity. Okay, other terms that we use for God, creator and things like that, those have to do with his relationship vis-a-vis -vis us. But father is who he is in his identity, okay? It's who he's always been. And again, if, he ha if he's the father and that's who he is, then he's got children and that's us. Everything in this Catholic life is ordered to becoming a part of the family of God, period. And God is family. This is so fundamental to our Catholic faith. I was on um, Father Mitch Packwood's show last year on EWTN Live, and we were talking about the issues that I had as a convert in coming into the church with Mary. I and mean, she was hard for me, very, very difficult. And one of the things that got me over the hump with Our Lady was the fact that Scripture is full of this familial language. In fact, the Bible is really just one big genealogical line. Those of you who have done the Journey Through Scripture series are very familiar with this, right? And understanding that, that God is a family and that's what he's conveying in sacred scripture gave me context for Mary. You have a father, you got a son, and then there's Mary, and she's our mother. Now, obviously, she's not divine. I don't want to be accused of heresy. I have all other talks where I talk about spousal union with the Holy Spirit and their relationship and all the rest of that. I get that. But recognizing the fact that there is a family of God helped me to understand Mary's place in the divine economy. And the reason why the Bible is full of this familial language, again, is because God is family. St. John Paul II said that God in his deepest mystery is not a solitude, but a family, because he has within himself fatherhood, sonship, and the essence of the family, which is love. And again, some of you are like, well, wait, where's the mom? 
It's the love portion in there, which Mary embodies in her relationship to the Holy Spirit. But I don't want to get sidetracked off into all that. That's a lot of St. Maximilian Colby, some beautiful theology there. So God is a family of divine persons. That's the family for which you and I were made. So by joining ourselves to Jesus Christ, we become part of that family. That's what the Bible is really all about. It's the story about God's undying, unchanging, overwhelming, stupendous love for you, his child. And this life is all about making that relationship with Almighty God a reality. Okay? And some of you are like, well, Matt, how do we make that happen? How do we enter into that relationship? Because I've been hearing this language since before I was conceived. I know I'm a child of God. I've heard about God as my father and Jesus as my brother, but I struggle with what that relationship really looks like. How does that apply in, in, the, in the actual world? Well, obviously, the, the way we enter into the family of God starts with the sacraments. Right? That's fundamental. It starts with baptism and confirmation and Eucharist and our confession and, and all the rest that, that are ordered for your vocation. But realize this, Catholics. The sacraments don't do you any good if you do not have a life of prayer. There's enough grace in one consecrated host to save the entire world. The only thing stopping it is us. Prayer is what gets us out of the way and opens the channels so that the grace of God can have its maximum impact upon our lives so it can transform us, okay? You have to have a life of prayer. Prayer is the key that unlocks the door of your spiritual life, of your relationship with, with Jesus Christ. It waters the soil so that grace can actually take root and our soul can grow and can bear fruit. So now let's pivot from sacred scripture to the life of prayer. Because I know y'all know you're supposed to pray. I know you know it. I know you've heard it. But a lot of people are still wondering what in the world prayer actually consists of. Because for a lot of people, even good Catholics, prayer is that thing you do when you see the flashing blue lights in the rearview mirror, right? <laughs> oh, God, I'll never do it again, right? <laughs> or prayer is for your spouse to do on your behalf. Or prayer is you know, something for monks and nuns who seem to have a lot, whole lot more free time than the rest of us. Or maybe it's just a crutch. You know, weak people need that. That's the way a lot of people view prayer. And its opening page on the subject, the catechism uses the definition of St. Therese of Lisieux. And she says, for me, a prayer is a surge of the heart. It's a simple look turned toward heaven. It's a cry of recognition and of love, embracing both trial and joy. Now, notice she does not define it in one simple way. She says, it's a surge. It's a look. It's a cry. Therese is telling us that there are many different faces and facets to our prayer life. But even though there are different faces and facets, you can basically boil it down to one thing. It is personally relating to God. And notice I said personally. In this day and age, everybody's using social media. We have completely lost the idea, at least a lot of people have, of what personal relationships actually look like. They're not bad, but God's not on Facebook, okay? He certainly doesn't have a Twitter account. But what he wants is to share himself with us, and he's inviting us to share ourselves with him. That's really what prayer is in its essence. And I want you to step back and think about this for a second because we're so used to this idea of this personal relationship that we can have with Almighty God that we forget the opportunity that is laid at our feet. You can't get the manager of Kroger on the phone, if you called. But the God of the universe is constantly on hold, waiting for us to just pick up the phone, so to speak. He's waiting. And all he wants to do is share himself with you. And he wants you to share himself or yourself with him. That's the essence of prayer. And let me tell you something. Prayer works. It does. I'm sure many of you guys have, have experienced this in your life. And I'm not just saying that because it's the title of one of my books so you can get down to the bookstore. There's my bad pitch, okay? But prayer really does work. <laughs> Thank you. I'll give you your five bucks later. So <laughs> prayer really does work. Realize that God is not just concerned with all the big things in your life. And I don't mean he wants you to do, you know, spend an hour in prayer trying to decide what color socks to wear. But even the smallest things in your life, God is concerned with. He's your father. 
I got six kids. I'm concerned with all kinds. I have to dress half my kids every day. So yes, I am concerned with sock color at times. Most of the time, I'm just happy they're putting shoes on when we go to mass. But God wants to take care of every aspect of your life. I'll never forget, just a few months after I became Catholic, I was a student here at Franciscan, and I was in O'Hare Airport getting ready to fly to Austria to do my study abroad semester. And I was flying with a couple of my friends, and the problem was we were flying standby. Now, I fly a ton, speaking all over the place, and you just don't ever want to fly standby, much less internationally. And to make matters worse, there had been storms in Germany for two days, and flights were all backed up. And this gate was packed with people who wanted on the last plane getting out of Dodge to Frankfurt, Germany. And I wanted on that plane. And they called everybody, and me and my two buddies were the only three people left in the gate. And the whole plane was done, right? And I'm like, oh, God, please, right? Please let me get on this plane. It was like tumbleweeds going across the gate. My friends, they didn't care. You know why? Because they were in love. They're now married with six children. But all they wanted to do was make googly eyes at each other. They didn't care about spending the night in O'Hare. So I wanted to puke just looking at them. So I went across to the other side of the, of the gate, and I pulled out my rosary. And I was like, let's see if this thing works, right? <laughs> So I start praying. And I don't remember what decade it was, but I got to a certain point. I saw the, jet, or the gate agent come up off the jetway. And as he's walking by, I said, you wouldn't happen to have any more seats on that plane, would you? And he said, how many of you are there? I said, three. He said, grab your bags. I'm like, grab your bags. We ran to the ticket counter. He's like, it was the fastest check in airline history. We ran down the jetway, and we got on the plane. And I'm like, woohoo! Right? God, thank you. And Mary, too. Right? And I was like, thank you for getting us on this plane. Stewardess walks up and she says, welcome aboard our 747. We have three seats left on this plane. Two of them are in coach. One is in business class. I went, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> have fun touching knees or whatever you're going to do as Franciscan students, right? So I went and I sat down in the biggest, fattest leather chair I'd ever seen. I was like, this is fantastic. God, I'm on the plane. You got me in business class. It doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> then the stewardess walked up and she said, gentlemen, I'd like to take your order for dinner tonight. Tonight's menu is chicken or filet mignon. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, Mr. Johnson? I said, Mr. Johnson couldn't make it, but Mr. Leonard will have the filet. Right? <laughs> So prayer works, people. <laughs> God is concerned with your life. <laughs> but really, prayer is something that's built into our DNA. Realize that. This is something that you were made for. This is one of the reasons why you enter into a real life of prayer. Over time, it becomes easier. doesn't mean you're not going to experience obstacles in your prayer life, but it's a lot easier after you've been praying for a year than when you first started. Why? Because this is what you were made for. You were made to enter into this kind of relationship with Almighty God. Remember, God wants us to be part of his divine family. He made us, he made us for himself, right? By God and for God as the catechism says. And the only way that we can enter into the divine life of God, that we can become part of the family again, is if we become like him. Okay? We have to become like him. And the catechism says that prayer restores man to God's likeness. Okay? So we have to do this. That's how we re-enter and we re-engage in the divine family of God. Now, I know that you guys know you're uber Catholics. There are three different modes or states of prayer. Vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer. I cannot go through all these stages in detail. They're in both of my books. Um, but the catechism says it is not enough to have the will to pray. Hell is paved, the road to hell is paved with what? Good intentions. It doesn't matter if you have the will to pray. You have to know how to do it, the catechism says. There is an art to praying that is essential to the art of living as a Catholic. That's why I write books. That's why I have a podcast. That's why I do videos and all the rest of it. This is the fire that burns inside of me. It has transformed my life. And if you don't have a deep life of prayer, it will transform yours as well. I can tell you right now that the one thing that most Catholics do not have in their life that they need is a deep life of authentic Catholic meditation. 
You have to have this, guys. And authentic Catholic meditation doesn't mean twisting your body into some kind of a pretzel. It's got nothing to do with down dog or however you do that. It has nothing to do with emptying your mind either, like, like Eastern religions, which is the dumbest thing ever. Like, who wants a blank mind, right? Catholic meditation is about filling your mind up with God. That's what it's really all about. We want to fill ourselves up with him. It's the quest of the mind to seek to understand the why and the how of the Christian life, says the catechism, in order to adhere and respond to what the Lord is asking. And it's so important that St. Alfonso Ligori says that short of a miracle, a person who does not enter into mental prayer, meditation, will end up in mortal sin. Period. In another place, he paraphrases St. Teresa of Avila, and he says, if you are not entering into regular meditative prayer, you do not need demons to carry you to hell. You carry yourself there in your own hands. Now, that's terrifying. And I don't like the smell of burning flesh, especially when it's my own, right? I'm assuming you guys don't either. So you have to pray. In fact, in one of my favorite spiritual theology books, those of you who are in Next Level Catholic Academy, I reference this guy constantly because he's phenomenal. Father Adolphe Tanqueray in The Spiritual Life says that meditation is the most effective means of assuring one's salvation. Meditation. you got to do it. Okay? Now, you're like, wait, how do I do that? At the bottom of your handout, there, is, there are directions for you to get a free cheat sheet on meditation. Of prayer. It's a three-page PDF. It's free. Just use the directions at the bottom of the handout, and you get it delivered right to your inbox. Okay? There are tens of thousands of copies of this thing. It's just the basics of how you enter into Catholic meditative prayer. Okay? So it is not an option. Meditation is a necessary part of your spiritual life if you're going to get to heaven. Okay? The church knows that you need it, which is why there's an entire section of the catechism that's only about prayer. And a huge part of it is about meditation. Now, what is it? Basically, meditation is attentive reflection on God aided by some kind of a spiritual input. Attentive reflection on God aided by some kind of a spiritual input. It could be a book. It could be a piece of art. It could be all kinds of different things, right? Maybe you're even in nature and you see something which helps you move into meditation. But it's an interior prayer where God begins to reveal himself to us. And it's not a one we ponder on the mysteries of God, and he begins to speak to us. So there's a conversation that takes place. We focus on him, he speaks to us. And meditation is not shooting the breeze with God. Like, how you doing, God? Right? Whenever I enter into a third-person voice, it always is Italian. I have no idea why. <laughs> but that's not the way we're supposed to do it. Prayer, realize this, guys. This is baseline. Prayer is always ordered to action. Always. Prayer is meant to transform your life because the whole process is about being conformed to Jesus Christ. And that involves some process here. Now, and speaking of process, this is one of the biggest areas of confusion for most Catholics when it comes to, to prayer. Prayer is not the same thing as process. Okay? Realize this. Prayer is a relationship with a divine person. It's not your Magnificat. It's not your prayer card. It's not your big fat breviary with the ribbons hanging down that shows everybody how holy you are. And yes, I have one too, all right? It's not that. Okay, prayer is God, right? And it, all those things are good. Don't get me wrong. Those are necessary things, but they are tools. They are preparation to get you to move into real prayer. Don't just keep plowing through your rosary or your litanies just to get done. Because the goal isn't to get done the goal is God. That's what it's all about. It would be like if you call up your friend, you're like, come meet me for coffee. And when they show up and they're sitting across the table from you, you stay on your phone. Makes no sense, right? Put the tool down. Focus on the person in front of you, okay? You could go so far as to say that technically speaking, that reading and pondering and even reflection and, and, and focusing on the mysteries of God, that's not really prayer. They are preparation for the movement of the heart and will to God. But true prayer, says Father Thomas Dubé, who also wrote some great books on prayer, is adoring, thanking, praising, and sorrowing with inner quiet words. That's what prayer consists of. That means when your interior conversation with God starts, put down the thing that you're using to move you into that relationship. 
Okay, and also, don't be afraid to change things up. If you find this technique that you've been using for a long time in your meditative prayer is no longer helping you move into that conversation with God, then move on to something else. The one exception to that is the rosary. Our Lady said, pray the rosary. And guess what? I listened to Our Lady. So you keep praying your rosary. Prayer is not about feelings. It doesn't matter how you feel, okay? It's an act of the will. Sometimes you're going to have consolation. Sometimes you're not, okay? We can talk about that in the Q&A if you want to. But let me zoom in now on one of the church's favorite forms of meditation. And uh, Monsignor Charles Pope referenced this last night. And I'll bet you a lot of you guys are already doing this. But I want to talk for a moment about Lexio Divina. Now, Lexio Divina is just a phrase that means divine reading. It's reading and praying over sacred scripture. And it's been around for ages. In fact, Pope Benedict XVI takes it all the way back to the third century with Origen. And from Origen, Ambrose and Augustine and others learn the method. Origen says this, while you attend to this Lexio Divina, Seek a right and with unwavering faith in God, the hidden sense which is present in most passages of the divine scriptures. So because it's the story of how you're saved, the Bible is a really important part of our movement toward God, to our dialogue with God. When you read the Bible, says St. Augustine, you, God speaks to you. When you pray, you speak to God. And Lexio Divina is so important because you're not just reading a book. You are having an engagement with divinity, right? This is an engagement with the divine life of God. Now, it follows a very similar format to other forms of meditation, which you'll see if you download that, that PDF that uh, I describe on the bottom of your handout. But because Lexio Divina is all about the Bible and the Bible is a divine text, that means Lexio is in a class by itself, okay? Now, there are four basic steps. They're on your handout. Reading, meditation, prayer, and contemplation. Those of you who have really tried to read the Bible know that it's a little bit trickier than reading, you know, a Harlequin romance book or a Tom Clancy novel, right? It's got all kinds of stuff going on. Sometimes you're like, what in the world does this mean? That's when a good commentary comes into play. Best one I've seen, uh, Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, right? Curtis Mitch wrote most of the commentary in it. It's phenomenal. But what you need to do is figure out the literal sense of what's being said. In other words, what did the human author intend to convey? That's always your starting point when you're doing this kind of prayer, okay? Then from there, you move on to step two, meditation. Now you're asking yourself, what does this passage actually mean to me? Is the Lord speaking to me? Is there something that catches my attention? If the answer is yes, you pause and you move to three. You pray. If the answer is no, you keep on reading, okay? Remember, true prayer doesn't consist of method. It's the result of the method. True prayer is the movement of the heart toward God. Now, Lexio ends with contemplation, during which we take up as a gift from God, says Benedict, his own way of seeing and judging reality. So in other words, contemplating scripture gives us the mind of Christ so that we can see the world as it really is. It gives us the ability to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart, says Hebrews 4.12. That's the power of reading over the, uh, and praying over the word of God. Now, Guigo the Carthusian. Guigo the Carthusian sounds like local Italian muscle who moved to Steubenville from Chicago, right? He's really the guy who wrote the classic text on Lexio Divina. It's a 12th century monk. This is what he says. This is how he summarizes Lexio Divina. Reading seeks the sweetness of the blessed life. Meditation finds it. Prayer asks for it. And contemplation tastes it. The guy's Italian, right? He's comparing it to eating here. In another place he says, reading places solid food in the mouth. Meditation chews and breaks it. Prayer extracts the flavor. Contemplation is the very sweetness that gives joy and refreshes. Like the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, if you're a member of the science of sainthood, you know that contemplation, I hammer this constantly, contemplation is not something you make happen. Contemplation is a gift from God. It is the highest of all three stages of the, spirit, of, of the three modes of prayer. Okay, It is an infused prayer. 
the Latin, it's infusum, which means that which is poured in, okay? You can't make it happen. It's a gift from God. What's happening is at that stage of your prayer life and your spiritual life, the infinite is starting to be poured into the finite. God is literally pouring himself into you, okay? So you don't make it happen. You can't conjure it up on your own. What that means is, with regard to Lexio Divina, it's not something you kind of whip out of your prayer pocket anytime you want to. Lexio Divina has to be practiced and, and done repeatedly in order for it to have an impact upon your life. Otherwise, Guigo says the exterior letters will profit the, the reader nothing, okay? And Lexio Divina has gotten really popular, lots of books about it these days. One of the things a lot of people don't talk about with regard to Lexio Divina is the fact that when you start reading the masters of this method, like Guigo the Carthusian, very quickly you realize that what he's really doing is connecting different parts of sacred scripture. So you better know the story of the Bible if you're really gonna get out of Lexio Divina what you want. So if you think that Noah led the Israelites out of Egypt to the promised land, you should go back and watch, uh, you know, Genesis to Jesus, okay? You got to know the story so you can really enter into Lexio Divina. But really, at the end of the day, Lexio is meant to lead to action. It's supposed to transform your life. It's supposed to make you like Jesus Christ. You don't put on the mind of Christ just to think differently, right? You have to act differently. Lexio is supposed to make you more humble and patient and loving and kind, more like Jesus Christ. And if you're going to be like Jesus Christ, there's one other thing we got to talk about here. And that is something that a lot of us don't fully grasp or understand the importance of. Silence. This is huge. Now, typically, we associate noise with our kids or our grandkids. I got six kids. Sometimes the TV is so loud, the neighbors two houses away know what we're watching. Okay. But really, even though we associate it with, with, with our kids and our grandkids and all the rest, when we shush our kids or grandkids, it's really so we can hear something else. We want to hear the iPad or the radio or the TV or whatever else. We're not really craving silence most of the time. And, and in this day and age, we are so conditioned for distraction and noise. It's everywhere. Music is constantly assaulting us. You walk into the grocery store and there's music playing. You, get on, you go pump gas, and all of a sudden TV screens pop up and start yapping at you. You get on an elevator, and you're hearing a bad orchestral version of Millie Vanilli, right? You're like, give me a break. Why? Why all this constant noise? Well, it's really pretty easy, actually. Silence is scary. Silence is scary. It forces us to peer inside and be honest with ourselves, right? In silence... You're confronted with yourself. In fact, you could go so far as to say that silence puts us to the test because it forces us to peer inside and to be honest with ourselves. I once read about how soon to be beatified Archbishop Fulton Sheen uh, made any directee that came to him go to adoration for a solid hour with no books, no nothing, just them and God. And the reason why he did it is because he knew that God would do all the heavy lifting for him. Okay? Now, unfortunately, the modern world has no time or tolerance for silence. Like, it's got no value in our utilitarian universe. We're so obsessed with production and exploitation of resources. So what do you do with silence? It has no value. I, I, what can I do with it? Who's going to pay for silence? Now, in the eyes of the world, silence is a holy uselessness, says the French philosopher Max Picard. And one of our problems is that we have a tendency to view silence as the absence of anything, right? But really, silence isn't a nothing. Silence is the reality into which sound invades. Think about it. I stop talking. Silence. It's always there. And silence is sacred. This is why when you walk into a beautiful church, when you're on pilgrimage in Europe or wherever, you walk into this beautiful place and all of a sudden you go, you lower your voice. Why? Because the knowledge of who dwells there and this beauty that you're surrounded with creates a feeling of awe and reverence which naturally translates into silence. Even the most beautiful piece of sacred music doesn't belong in an adoration chapel. We need silence to enter recollected into the presence of Almighty God. We've got to quiet the exterior noise. It's always threatening to drown out our interior lives. Solitude stills our passions and gives our reason an opportunity to cut them out of the soul, 
says St. Basil the Great. I love that quote. And the problem is we don't like to do it. Most of us would rather go dig a ditch for 15 minutes than be quiet with God. It's hard when you first try and be quiet with God, isn't it? It's hard when you try and be quiet with God after five years of praying. We have so many competing things, but quiet is a necessity if you're going to put yourself in the presence of God. The Heavenly Father has spoken one word, says John on the cross. It was his son, and he speaks it eternally in an eternal silence. And it's in silence that it can be heard by the soul. But silence is also something that's more than just no sound, okay? We have to quiet our interior lives too. St. Isaac of Nineveh, great Eastern father, says, let us love silence till the world is made to die in our hearts. Isn't that beautiful? Seek after a quiet mind, says Basil. And if you haven't noticed, our minds love to wander all over kingdom come even when we're so-called quiet, right? Your mind goes everywhere. How many times have you been in an adoration chapel and you're like, oh, God, thank you, God. And you're like, man, this carpet's from the 80s. I mean, we're so ADD, right? We need quiet. You know, distraction from within is just as problematic as, as distraction from without. And St. Teresa of Avila says, if you experience distraction in prayer, just give it back to God and it becomes a prayer in and of itself. But it's better to never be distracted in the first place. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you move into, for those of you from the 60s, Maxwell Smart's cone of silence right, for the rest of your life. But what it does mean is reigning in your consumption of the world in general terms. This is really hard. It's really hard. Interior quiet is not a switch you can flip any old time you want. You have to set yourself up for this. Don't ever forget that the sights and sounds that we put into our mind, are, they affect us. Right? They're food for the imagination. And it's vitally important that we guard what it is that we put into our minds. Yeah, it's hard enough to focus when innocent distractions abound, right? It's downright impossible to focus if, if your mind is distracted and consumed with the trash you dumped into it last night because you were binging on Netflix, which you should have canceled already anyway because of their abortion stance. Okay? It's hard. I know, people. It's hard. But prayer is something that's supposed to extend to your entire life. When you walk into an adoration chapel, you go into prayer, your mind is going all over the place. And so what do you do? Well, like, man, maybe I turn the radio off on my way to the adoration chapel so I can begin to quiet down before I ever get into the adoration chapel. And then you take it back even further. Well, maybe I shouldn't uh, just fill my mind with all these things anyway. Take a hard look at what you are filling your mind with. This is a really big question. And I'm not saying dissociate yourself completely from culture. Right? We have to be a part of this world and we need to be leavened in this culture. But it is a fine line to walk. Because remember, it doesn't just stay inside either. As the old saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. That's right. Now, the book of James. The book of James scares the dickens out of me. It does. Because this guy doesn't pull any punches. This is why I took him as my confirmation name when I became Catholic. James says, he writes what I think is one of the most sobering verses in all of sacred scripture. He says, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this man's religion is vain. <gasps> right? It's vain. Realize that as a participation in the divine life of God, our spiritual lives are of a very, very delicate nature. Even small, quote unquote, sins and there's nothing really small about any sin because all sin is an affront against Almighty God. But even small sins can derail our ascent to God. Like it snuff out the fervor that we have inside of our hearts. And there is no easier sin than saying something we shouldn't. Can I get an amen? amen. Not controlling your tongue is one of the fastest ways to regress in the spiritual life. And one of the reasons why James and others speak so forcefully about our tongue is because they are a great indicator of what is inside of us. Jesus says, you brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our imperfections make themselves known by what we say. If you think lewd thoughts, it'll come out as lewd speech. If you're envious of another person, you will backstab. If you're angry with somebody else, look out, right? 
person can actually tame the little monster in their mouth, it's a pretty fair indicator that they are growing in other parts of the spiritual life as well. But since the tongue is a fire, says James, full of deadly poison, this is all easier said than done, is it not? And history shows that a lot of people went to great lengths to avoid the sins of the tongue. The desert fathers are called the desert fathers because they moved out to the desert, partly so they wouldn't have anybody else around to talk about. Right? Now, you and I are not desert fathers. What are we supposed to do? Is there any hope for anybody who lives in a city of population more than one? And there is hope. That's what grace is for. And, and don't get me wrong. It's not that speaking of itself is bad. Right? That's not what I'm saying. In fact, our ability to speak is one of humanity's distinguishing features. And I don't care what the Animal Planet channel tells me. My dog is never going to talk to me. Okay? Flipper doesn't talk to the kid in the show, right? It doesn't mean anything, all right? <laughs> I love that show. But we, we use our tongues to communicate ideas and to glorify Almighty God. And, and really, if I was just to be quiet around the house all the time, my wife would probably have a few choice words for me. That would be followed by the dreaded silent treatment, which is not the kind of silence you want. So you have to speak. And God created the world through speech, right? Words are so powerful, which is why we have to be so careful with them. You can build somebody up. You can tear somebody to shreds with your tongue. And look, the, the Catholic faith was proclaimed verbally long before it was ever written down, which was news to me as a Protestant. But James says, bridle your tongue. Right? Not cut it off. We have to talk. Rather than being a total negation of speech, Silence is a means to help us put our tongue to right use, right? Which remains a problem for most of us. And while it's obvious we have to speak at appropriate times, it's more than obvious that a lot of the things that we say should never have been said at all. Much of our speech is motivated by, pri is motivated by pride and jealousy and anger and a whole host of other bad things. And for some reason, we think that cutting somebody else down to size is going to elevate ourselves when in reality, all it does is lower our standing with God. And even when you are not denigrating someone else, excessive speech can be problematic. Many of us love to chat. We love to be the person with the breaking news that nobody else has heard. Right? And what is that? Why, why do people like that so much? Because it gives us a sense of superiority. It gives us a sense of control, which really at its root is nothing more than egoism. It's pride. Incorrect use of the tongue doesn't just damage us. It also damages other people as well. We love to say something that we know will set somebody else up, right? We do this all the time. We want a particular response from someone. We know exactly what to say. How simple it is to say something we know will elicit a negative comment from somebody else. Even a question as innocuous as, guess who called again, is problematic if you're saying it and you know you're setting it up so the other person then launches into negative commentary on their own about that person. We got to be really careful what we say. Jesus said, temptations of sin are sure to come, but woe to him by whom they come. Now, those are scary words, but they're not the scariest. If I had to pick one verse out of the Bible that scared me more than any other, it's Matthew 12, 36. I tell you, on the day of judgment, men will render account for every careless word they utter. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. I said some stupid stuff in my life for which I love to take the eternal etch-a-sketch, right? <laughs> and start all over again. So what are we supposed to do? How do we tame the beast? Well, the solution's really supremely simple, but it's devastatingly difficult. Stop talking. As much as possible, stop talking. Even when your emotions are running amok, put a sock in it. Put two socks if you have to. Don't forget that if you don't act on an emotion that's happening, oftentimes it will lose its force. Now, I'm not saying you repress your emotions so you have a heart attack, but you know, like people get really angry, and you take a step back and you take a few deep breaths, right? <sighs> it goes away. Don't lash out. You got to get into the habit of not speaking first, right? 
Um, you gotta, really what it is, it's mortification. It's mortifying your, your desire for speech and the sinful satisfaction that speech can lead to, just like you would mortify your desire for beer or chocolate like during Lent. That's what it's about. God gave us a tongue to glorify him. Too often, we're just glorifying ourselves. What did mama say? If you can't say anything good? Now, I realize this is pretty rich coming from a guy who makes his living traveling the world and speaking to thousands of people on a regular basis. I get the irony, all right? And I'm betting that speech is necessary for you too, right? Now, you can maintain silence even when you are speaking if you follow the golden rule of Father Edward Lean, one of the greatest spiritual writers of the 20th century. This is what he says. The rule is never to speak merely for one's own sake or for one's own gratification or to satisfy some impulse, but solely for the glory of God, for the right accomplishment of duty, for the promotion of truth, for the exercise of charity, for the comfort of the sorrowful, and for the purpose of brightening the day of one's fellows. I'll probably just try and shut up, right? That's hard to live up to, isn't it? But that's the goal. And don't forget that Jesus Christ did the same thing. You want to be conformed to Jesus Christ? Scripture is replete with examples of Christ going out into the wilderness. In Mark, the Holy Spirit drove him out into the wilderness so he could be quiet for 40 days and 40 nights before he even launched his public ministry. He was up all night in silence with his father before he chose the 12 disciples. So if the second person of the most holy trinity found silence and quiet as a necessary part of his conversation with the father, shouldn't we too? Right? All right. Now, there's a reason I started with the Bible and then moved to prayer. And the reason why is because the Bible and prayer go together like Hall and Oates. Okay? <laughs> or some of you are older, like, who are Hall and Oates? Captain and Tennille. Okay? <laughs> are the, are the carpenters. All right? Look, this is one of the things that reminds me of how great it is to be a Catholic. Because realize, I had the Bible and prayer as a Protestant. My Bible wasn't quite as big, but it was still pretty good. I was reading and praying over sacred scripture long before I ever thought about becoming one of you people. But that's as far as I could take it. But the Catholic Church takes it to the next level. Why? Because the Bible and prayer come together fully in the Mass, and they lead us to the Eucharist. They lead us to a real encounter with Almighty God. It's in the liturgy that God interacts with us most powerfully. Personal prayer finds its end in the liturgy. It's source and goal, says the catechism. Why? Because the liturgy is the activity toward which the, is the, excuse me, the liturgy is the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed. Everything you do is ordered to the liturgy, which means, people, if you have a daily mass that is available to you and you don't have anything that's keeping you from going, what is wrong with you? The God of the universe makes himself available to us, and that's the summit toward all of our activity as Catholics is to enter into that communion that we have with him that's only available in the Eucharist. If you can get to daily mass, you better get there, right? The liturgy is what brings us into the mystery of God. This is where heaven and earth kiss, right? This is where all the love that God has for us that you see play out in sacred scripture that you begin to experience in your life of prayer come together where God literally pours himself out into us. We become part of him. He becomes part of us. We're consuming him in the same way that the Israelites consumed the Passover lamb back in Exodus 12. Why did they partake of that sacrifice? Because it became a part of them and they it. That's what we do with Jesus Christ in the mass. St. Augustine says, if you receive well, you are what you have received. We eat God. Get to the liturgy as often as you possibly can. Guys, this is what it's all about. And this whole progression is laid out in the liturgy. We start with the liturgy of the word. It leads us to the liturgy of the Eucharist and prayer is sprinkled all the way through this. It's in the liturgy that all of our preparation, all of our reading and our meditating, our Lectio Divina, this is where it finds its end. It's in the liturgy where we most fully become what it is that we were made to be, sons and daughters of Almighty God, real members of the divine family. That's what this is all about. That's what this conference is all about. That's what your Catholic life is all about. It's about becoming a real member of the family of God and realize you cannot be a member of the family of God unless you are like the rest of the family of God. You have to be. And, and this is something that most Catholics just don't get. 
In fact, again, I'm not trying to do a commercial here. You Science of Sainthood people, you know this. And forgive me for repeating this, but this is so foundational. This is how I explain this all the time. So if you've heard me do this before, forgive me, but I'm riffing on St. Thomas Aquinas, which is always a good thing to do. This is what it means to be part of the family of God. How many of you have a pet? How many of you consider your pet to be a member of the family? Go ahead. I got a dog too. <laughs> My in-laws had a dog named Dixie. Dixie, Dixie was more of a doglet than a dog. Okay, Dixie was an eight pound soaking wet toy Manchester Terrier. My mother-in-law loved Dixie. She called Dixie her furry little child. Now I'm the son-in-law. I never got called the furry little child. And you can probably see why, right? But when Dixie had to go to the bathroom, guess what? Dixie didn't get to go to the bathroom. Dixie had to go outside. Why? Because Dixie is a dog. Okay? Even the son-in-law goes to the bathroom. Now, compare Dixie's relationship as a dog in the family with a real furry little child, half Greek and half Italian, that gets wedded into a family. That baby can become part of the family in the way the dog never can. Why? Because even though it doesn't share the same bloodlines, it shares the same nature as the rest of the family. It's human like the rest of the family. God takes this whole divine adoption thing and he kicks it up on steroids. Because Jesus, the second person of the most holy trinity, in his divinity came and he took humanity, his sacred humanity, and he wedded it to his divine nature. So that through the sacraments, you and I pass through his sacred humanity and on into his divinity. Why? So we can be like him. So that we can participate in the divine nature of God, says 2 Peter 1.4. If you're going to be a member of the divine family of God, you have to be divine like the rest of the family. You have to share the same nature as the rest of the family. That's what this is all about. That's what the incarnation, passion, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ was all ordered to. We talk about the family of God. There is a reality there. Your entire movement through this life is about reacquiring the nature of God. It's going beyond what Adam and Eve had. I shouldn't even say it's reacquiring. You're going beyond what Adam and Eve had back in the garden. Oh, happy fault, oh, necessary sin of Adam, which gained for us so great a redeemer. Why is it a happy fault? Because now we get to become part of the family of God in a real way. Adam was on his way into the family. He got derailed. He got sidetracked. got kicked out of the family before he was fully divinized. The catechism says he was destined to be divine. It never happened. You are destined to be divine in reality, and it happens primarily through the sacraments in a life of prayer. But you have to become divine. This is the public secret of Catholicism. I don't know why more people aren't talking about this. If we really understood this, we wouldn't be tearing churches down, selling them to Protestants, or becoming nightclubs. It breaks my heart. We'd be busting out the walls to add additions because more people were going, how do I get a piece of this? But we're not living this. Because we haven't really fully absorbed the fact that your destiny is to be divine. That's mind-blowing when you think about it. Is it not? Is it not, Catholics? Yeah. Amen to that. Well, I realize we don't become equal to him. I want to be very specific about this. We don't become equal to God. Right? We participate through grace in his nature. God pours himself out so that we participate in, through his love in who he is. So he remains God, we remain creatures, but we are divinized by grace. Grace is unbelievable, the power that it has, and we waste it so often. But that is the divinizing principle. So by reading the word and entering into prayerful communion with the word, we become one with the word. That's what it's all about. That's what Catholicism is all about. And it's not something that just happens later when you go to heaven. It's something that happens right now through a life saturated in scripture, through a deep life of prayer, and getting to the sacraments as often as you possibly can. And realize God, the maker of the universe, who holds your very being in existence right now, is your father. And he wants you to be a part of his family. But you've got to get close to him for that to happen. You've got to get close to him so you can hear exactly what it is that he wants you to do in every aspect and area of your life. Draw nigh unto him and he will draw nigh unto you, says the book of James. I can yell at the top of my lungs for my kids to come in for dinner, but if they're outside and the door is closed, they're not going to hear me. You've got to pray to get close to God. You've got to get to know sacred scripture to know Jesus. St. Jerome says ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Jesus Christ. You've got to know the story. And you know, knowing the Bible 
reading the Bible really help you go off the rails when you're trying to make big decisions in your life. Because you see how God works, right? Prayer in the Bible. And what I don't mean by that, I know you've heard about people doing this. They take their Bible. And they're like, oh, God, give me a word. All right? My son, Billy, he's a teenager. He's driving me crazy, God. Please, give me a word. You open it up. You're like, oh, the book of Genesis. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him a sacrifice upon one of the mountains, which I shall show you. You're like, Billy? You might want to rethink your actions. <laughs> Don't do that, okay? Get to know the story and get to know God. That's how you're going to get to know what it is that he wants you to do with your life. You've got to take time to, to pray. You've got to take time to get to the sacraments. And if you put your relationship with God first, you'll be more tuned into what it is that he wants for your life. You'll be able to hear what it is he wants you to do in every single aspect of your life. And more importantly, you will enter into divine life. That's the pearl of great price. That is the prize beyond compare. So get into God and let him get into you. Amen? Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, you give us all there is because what you give us is yourself. Help us to live according to your promises. Help us to move into divinity. Thank you in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, I know you guys are fighting the food coma. I ended right on time. So, before I take any questions, which I will, I just want to hold up the bookstore asked me to do this. Look, the two books that I have, I've already signed a bunch of copies. They got more copies there. This one goes through prayer, vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer, and the three stages of the spiritual life, which most people have never heard of. The purgative, illuminative, and unitive ways. I lay it out all in layman's language, and when you get that, everything changes. This one's an overview of the Catholic life that shows how it all ends in divinity. It's all about redemptive suffering and how to read sacred scripture and meditative prayer. All the Catholic things and how they end in divine life. So there, I've done my job as far as that goes. One other thing, Scott mentioned last night, Next Level Catholic Academy. Uh, it is closed down right now. I got too many people in it that, for me to handle at the point in time, so I shut it down. I'm reopening the doors to this at the end of the summer. It's, again, it's already the on largest online school of spiritual theology in, in the world. Um, there's a wait list. You sign up on the wait list, you get a discount, okay? Um, you can go to nextlevelcatholicacademy.com. It's on the bookmark. I know you guys are going to buy books. You guys have bought your books. I gave you a bookmark. All right? So, what questions can I answer? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, Father Edward Lean, L E E N. Father Edward Lean. Yes. Oh, the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. Yeah. You can buy that for like 15 bucks on Amazon. It's, the full Bible is not out yet. It will come out next year. The New Testament, you can buy in a bound version. You can buy fascicles of the Old Testament right now, but it's not all one bound copy. It's coming. Yes. Fulton, Fulton Sheen. Fulton Sheen. That's exactly right. Very, very powerful. He said Fulton Sheen made an, a holy hour every day. In fact, he made more than a holy hour every day. On the Art of Catholic podcast, which I have, which is free audio. If you guys don't know what podcasts are, um, someone can explain it to you. But my next guest uh, is named Monsignor Hilary Franco. And he is a man who lived with Fulton Sheen for five, well, 12 years, I think, and worked with him. If any of you guys ever saw, you know, if you're old enough to have ever seen Life is Worth Living or you've seen it on YouTube, this man that I interviewed was the angel who erased the blackboard for him. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. He's been a priest for 64 years. And not only did he live and work with soon-to-be beatified Fulton Sheen, he lived and worked with St. John Paul II. This guy's phenomenal. So he's the next guest I have on the Art of Cat. Uh, anybody else? Yes. The Spiritual Life by Father Adolf Tanqueray. T A N Q E R E Y. Tanqueray. I'm going to tell you right now, it's this thick. All right? <laughs> Guys, look, the reason why I started Next Level Catholic Academy to begin with is because all the things that we do as Catholics are ordered to the spiritual life. All kinds of other theology are great, right? But the rubber meets the road in how you live your life and how your interior life is integrated with God.
That's where it all comes together. You're not going to get to heaven by knowing the Bible. You're not going to get to heaven by knowing the dogmatics of the church. You're going to get to heaven if your interior life is wedded to God. That's what the spiritual life is all about. Next Level Catholic Academy is 10-minute videos that systematically lay out what the ancients called the science of sainthood. That's the name of the course. It's called the science of sainthood. Why? Because it's not a free-for-all. There is a systematic progression that you and I are supposed to go through in this life. Just like you grow from being an infant into adolescence and an adult in natural life, you do the same thing in the spiritual life. And it's all laid out. Can I get an amen from any Science of Sainthood members? Yeah. Woohoo! Right? Another question. Yes, ma'am. Who's your favorite father of the church? My favorite father of the church. That's so like picking between my children. My favorite father of the church is probably St. Ignatius of Antioch. And the reason why is because when I was coming into the church, uh, I first read him back in the second century saying that he was talking about the Eucharist, which blew my mind. I'm like, oh, that's a Catholic word. We don't have a Eucharist. And he said, if you are outside of your bishop, you are outside of Christ. We didn't have a bishop. And that was the first guy who was like, oh, my goodness. The Catholics might be right. And so that's why he remains my favorite. Yes, ma'am. Attentive reflection on God aided by some kind of a spiritual input. It's on your handout, that definition. Yes. Oh, yeah. With prayer and fasting first. <laughs> um, it's, it's just such an annoyance, isn't it? You're trying to enter into Almighty God, and it's even worse afterwards. Realize, guys, that the prayers that you give after you're receiving communion are the most powerful you can give because you're literally united with God in the closest way that you possibly can be. But you prepare for it before Mass. And other than having the priest say something from the ambo, that's the only thing I've ever seen that's effective. Or having the organist say something before Mass starts. Other than that, I don't know what to tell you because it drives me crazy too. Yes, ma'am. Is it for, is it someone, she's saying she has a struggle in praying for someone that she should be praying for. Is it someone that you're struggling with or someone that you actually want something good to happen to them? Yeah. You, your expectation should be that the will of God is going to be done. Um, St. John Damascene says, prayer is asking God for what is fitting. And that's the key. So you're praying for the will of the Lord to be done. And realize, guys, if you want the right answer, if you want to get what you want in prayer every single time, there is a real simple secret to it. You get close to God. You know why? Because the closer you conform yourself to Jesus Christ, all of a sudden the desires of your heart become his because you're joined to him. And the things that you're asking for in prayer are what he wants anyway. And he's going to grant that prayer every single time. But when you don't know what's going on in the, other, in the will or in the, the life of another person, you just pray for the will of God to be done. And that's the most important thing you can possibly do. You can still pray for someone to be healed and all the rest of it. Lord, I accept your will. Because you have to realize that if God is our father, that means that anything and everything that happens in our life happens for a reason. Look, when my mom was struggling with cancer for five years before she passed away, she passed away during my first semester here, right after I came into the church. I had to leave school three weeks early. And I struggled with that hard. Why, God, did you let that happen? She was the only person in my family who expressed any kind of an understanding of why I was becoming Catholic. And now she's still the only other Catholic in my family because she's probably hanging out with Therese right now because she had a devotion to, our late, or to Therese. But I had to get to the point where I accepted that in God's good and perfect will as my mother's loving father that it was in her eternal best interest that her time was up. That's the point we have to get to in our spiritual lives where you accept the will of God no matter what happens that's when you achieve the, that interior peace that the, that the church writers talk about. The peace that passes all understanding. 
You can't get there until you fully grasp the fact that God is your loving Father who always knows what's best for you even when you have no idea what's going on. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. They say, they say the rosary before Mass. Until you get the one dude who thinks a decade means it takes 10 years, and he's like, oh, hell, Mary, You're like, Mass is supposed to start. Yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's hard, but you make a commit to, commitment to do it. Now, I'm not a monk or a nun. I made a rookie mistake as a kid. I talk about this in the Science of Sainthood, actually, where when I first fell in love with the Lord through prayer life and I knew I needed to get really serious about my prayer life, I started sequestering myself off. I sneak off and I go pray, and I leave my wife to do the diapers. And finally, I realized, Matt, you idiot, you're a dad. That's your primary vocation. You need to be out there with your family because you're a dad, right? So what I had to do was say, okay, I got to get up before everybody else does. That's the only time I'm going to find to pray. This morning, I was up before everyone else. I went and I prayed my rosary. Now, I planned it. I know we're going to have a holy hour tonight, so I planned the rest of my meditation during that. Um, my schedule is such, and you have to have a schedule. If you don't, it's not going to happen. That's why the, the monks and nuns have rules of life, right? So you have to have a schedule. For me, in the mornings, I get up really early. We're at 7 a.m. Mass. We go to Mass as a family. It's hard, guys. It's a commitment. But Jesus Christ was beaten to a bloody pulp on a cross for me. What am I going to do for him? Right? So we go to Mass at 7 o'clock. I go to the Adoration Chapel after that, after dropping my kids off at school. And I spend a half an hour in Adoration. Um, I'm praying my rosary where I can fit it in. But I do the rosary every day without fail. Meditation. You, at least do 15 minutes. Okay? We're not monks and nuns, most of us anyway. We have busy lives, right? So you do it according to your state in life. St. Francis de Sales is very clear about this. And you just got to keep your eyes on that because otherwise you're going to alienate the people around you because you're not going to be doing what you're supposed to be doing as a father or a, a, a mother or whatever your vocation is. But it's hard, and it changes based on season in life as well. But you have to have a rule of life. Right. It's a bapt yes, so sh I should have had the microphone up to you. She's talking about when we were baptized, we were entering into the life of grace, and we enter into the, the life of Christ as priest, prophet, and king. We enter into every aspect of, of God's life at baptism. And getting back to what we were just talking about, how you grow up in the faith, those three sacraments are the sacraments of initiation, right? So by the time we hit confirmation, whenever that is in your, in your diocese, um, What's supposed to happen is that seed that, of grace that was planted when you become part of the family of God at baptism, now you're not just a child of God. Now you're taking on the mission of Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be growing up in the faith enough to be able to start to live as a Christian based upon the grace you get. I know there's a big argument over when you should do confirmation. I'm of the camp where the earlier the better because I want the graces for my kids, right? But you're right. We're integrated into that, that mystery of who Jesus Christ is. But, of course, the baby doesn't realize that, right? But over time, the baby does. And our job is to make them to recognize that, right? And you know how you do this? Guys, it's not rocket science. You model your life of prayer. You model the Catholic life for your kids. My daughter, when she was eight years old, I think, I found a piece of paper that was a school project, and it was one of these where they start the sentences off and then the kid's supposed to fill it in. And one of the sentences on it was, my dad is my hero because, and she wrote, I see him pray. They, you have no idea what they're looking at. So you've got to model who the father is. This is terrifying to me as a dad. My kids are going to relate to Almighty God based on how I treat them. That's sobering. And same thing, ladies, with regard to Mary. We don't talk about that very often. But this is the reality. We model it for our kids just like Jesus Christ modeled it for us, starting with baptism. Yes? 
When I enter into meditation, how do I pick the scripture that I'm going to do? Sometimes I will have a book that I choose that I'm just going to make my way through that. Most of the time, though, I use the Liturgy of the Hours. I mean, I have the Magnificat on my phone. I use it a lot. And you, I just go through the daily readings or I use the, the morning prayers because they're just replete with scriptures. So I'm just praying along with the whole church, which is, there's real power in that. Yes. Yes. Generally speaking, yeah. Well, you're getting a nice liturgical discussion, aren't you? <laughs> because frankly, I'm of the opinion there shouldn't be, I mean, it's one thing to have background music, right? But as I said before, like after receiving the Eucharist, the most powerful time of meditative prayer. What are you supposed to be doing in Mass? Praying, right? And, and your union with God is consummated in that Eucharist. You're entering into the divine life of God. And this is what, the, being a human person, we relate to God through our five senses, right? That's the way he made us. It's very difficult for us to not be distracted by the things that are going on around us. That's why we need silence. And this isn't Matt Leonard's opinion. This is the opinion of the fathers of the church, the great spiritual writers who talk about the importance, the critical role of silence. When you walk into an adoration chapel, it's hard enough for me to quiet my mind. If I hear a tune that I know, like unaccompanied Bach, my mind is going right along with the music. Right? I'm not, it's so much difficult, more difficult for me to focus on Almighty God. That's why silence is so important because you've got to quiet down the interior life. I'm not saying music is bad at all. There are, there are time and place for everything. But when entering into meditative prayer, quiet is the, is the perfect environment for it. Yes? Absolutely. Am I a fan of St. Ignatius? I've, I've celebrated Mass on pilgrimage in St. Ignatius' room where he recuperated after he had his cannonball accident where he had his conversion. Yes, I'm a big fan. And his whole movement between desolation and consolation is a beautiful picture of our movement through the spiritual life because even as you mature in the spiritual life, you know there's suffering. And the more you go in the spiritual life, you know that suffering is so redemptive and you welcome it more and you even start to desire it, dare I say. And so your desolations actually become consolations in a weird, ironic way. But yes, I love St. Ignatius of Loyola. Yes, ma'am. Contemplation is the question. Okay, this is the last question because I know it's, uh, it's quarter after. You can't, again, you cannot make contemplation happen. It happens to you from God. You prepare for it through, mostly through meditative prayer, okay? That's how it happens. But you get to a point in the spiritual life where God starts to move you into contemplation. If you are someone who prays a lot, you have probably gotten to the point where you suddenly feel the urge to stop praying your rosary or to put the book down that you have and just be present with God. There's a great line uh, of the peasant in ours who said, I look at him and he looks at me, right? That's the beginnings of contemplation. You know, theologians talk about how it is we see God in the beatific vision in heaven. Contemplation is the beginning of that sight. How do you know it's happening? It's one of the things I go over in the science of sainthood, the next level Catholic Academy, right? There are, there, there are different markers, like what I just said. When you feel like the meditation is becoming like slogging through wet cement in, in galoshes, that's how you know, and all things being equal, like you're making spiritual progress. It's not because you're trying to get rid of the garbage that's in your mind, that kind of stuff. But when meditation starts to become difficult, that's when it's an indicator that you are beginning to move into contemplation, but you cannot make it happen. What happens is God kind of puts you in this tractor beam and he's slowly drawing you toward him. Now, that said, the spiritual life is a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? And so you can be in different stages and different modes of prayer at the same time. There are multiple levels in each one of these stages that you are making your way through. So you can have the beginnings of contemplation of that infused prayer and still be meditating in your transition time. And the spiritual writers differ with regard to exactly when it happens, but it happens at a different point for each person because even though we go through the same stages, you're an individual. 
and God's going to give it to you when he knows that you are ready. But you have to be aware of the nuances of what it is you're looking for, otherwise you can miss the boat, which again is one of the reasons why I founded this whole academy. So I will close with that. Thank you guys very much. God bless all of you and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>